a new Ferrari 296 GTB and some warm Andalusian roads because we could all do with a few moments of escapism. Stunning, isn't it? It's got the elegance and beauty, I think, of the Roma, but then married to some of the seriousness of the V12 models. There's a, a sort of modernity with this visor wraparound graphic here, and then the slightly retro, or the hints certainly, of the old 250 LM, worth every one of the 241,000 pounds that they're asking for it. I love it as well because it's quite a simple design, but then the more you look at it, the more you sort of, you see into the car for a start, and also you notice little bits of aero. So at the front, you can see the radiators behind. Underneath the number plate over there, there's their, what they're calling their aerodynamic tea tray, which is just this little fillip to help guide the air underneath the car. Headlights here underneath the DRLs, you've got the intake for the brake cooling, which comes down to the calipers here. And it's got the fins on the back that we first saw on the SF90 to help cool those big carbon ceramic brakes. As you move down the side of the car, you might be able to look down on the top of this steering column here. There's a sort of architectural quality to that. Moving down here, we've got the intercoolers and these huge um, intakes here on the sides of the cars and these beautiful haunches with the line across the top there. I love the fact that we've got this bridge up here, which you don't see. It could be really sort of jarring having a, um, a spoiler or wing or sort of whatever you want to call it up here. But it's only really when you get down like that that you can see through it. That, of course, is to bring the air here and help extract the heat from the engine. And talking of that rear engine deck, it's, it's beautiful. It's like looking down through some really clear water to see the innards inside. And those innards, well, in this we've got a hybrid system. So, sitting down here, along there, behind the seats, is a battery, a 7.45 kilowatt hour battery. And then behind that we've got the twin turbocharged 120 degree V6. And Ferrari's been quite careful because they're saying this is the first car to wear the Ferrari badge with a V6, because obviously there was the Dino before, which is a Ferrari, isn't a Ferrari. It's an ongoing debate. It feels a little bit, they've sort of, they've, they've included it in the family because they've been very specific about wearing a Ferrari badge because the Dino never wore the prancing horse. It just had that lovely Dino script in the uh, yellow on blue. But this, the first badged Ferrari to have a V6, and quite a V6 it is. Overall, this whole sort of powertrain puts out 830 brake horsepower, but the V6 itself puts out 663 brake horsepower, and then you get another 167 from the electric motor. The incredibly low mounted V6 is 2.9 litres in capacity, and Ferrari says it weighs 30 kilos less than its turbocharged V8, with a 10% improvement in chamber pressures. The counter-rotating turbos sitting in the V have redesigned impellers that allow the turbos to spin at 180,000 RPM and deliver 24% greater boost. A lot of attention has been paid to the sound, with a redesigned hot tube system to channel noise into the cabin, and an equal length exhaust manifold that channels the even pulses from the equally spaced firing of the V6 down Inconel tubes to a single outlet at the rear. The resultant harmonics have led the engineers to christen this V6 the Piccolo V12. 
A couple of other numbers that I'm sure you'll want, maximum torque is £546 foot, the gearbox is an 8-speed DCT from the SF90 but with a mechanical reverse gear this time, and the car's dry weight is 1470 kilos, with 130 kilos of that being attributable to the hybrid system. The electric motor, you can do 135 kilometers an hour on electric alone, and up to 25 kilometers purely on electric as well. All that power, instantly, goes just to the rear wheels, which, um, yeah, I'm gonna be intrigued to see how it puts all that down onto the tarmac. We've got a choice of tires, so this is wearing Mission Pilot Sport 4S's, but you can also go get Cup 2 R's for this as well, but we'll come back to those in a bit. For now, well, I think we should just go for a drive, really, shouldn't we? Not in this one, though. There's another one over here. I'm in a yellow sort of mood. Time for a couple of laps of the rather fabulous Monte Blanco circuit. Whilst I'm learning where on earth I'm going, it's worth saying that this is the Assetto Fiorano pack on this car. So that costs an extra just under £26,000 in the UK. And perhaps most interestingly, it gives you some passive dampers, some multimatic passive dampers. It also gives you some lightweight parts. If you add all the lightweight parts up, it saves about 15 kilos. There are also certain carbon fibre bits you can only get if you opt for the Assetto Fiorano pack. And also you can only get the decals that are on this car parking back to a 250 Le Mans livery. You can only get that if you have the Assetto Fiorano pack. So let me start out with the E Manitino. So we've got two Manitinos in here like the SF90, so E Manitino for all the, the drivetrain. And then the Dynamics Manitino over this side. So we've got the engine in its performance setting at the moment and then we've got the dynamics in race to start with. Uh, we're watching the shift lights up here and oh, it really does tramp on. To put some figures against that rather subjective assertion, it will go from 0 to 62 miles an hour in 2.9 seconds, reach 124 miles an hour in just 7.3 seconds, and hit over 205 miles an hour flat out. It was doing over 155 miles an hour at the end of Monte Blanco's main straight, at which speed it will generate 360 kilos of downforce with the LaFerrari-like rear spoiler deployed. So one of the things I really wanted to look at on track is this new ABS system. So all the side tip controls and everything, they're not claiming particularly big gains for those. What they are talking about is this ABS Evo system, which should help non-professional racing drivers, people like me in other words, to trail brake all the way up to an apex and the car remain really stable. So you gain time in that crucial bit of a lap where the very best drivers generally find they make their time. This new braking system also helps shorten the straight line stopping distance from 124 miles an hour to naught by a whopping 8.8% compared to the lighter F8 Tributo. Repeatability is also said to have improved by an impressive 24%. I should have said that the side slip control system has also taken something of a step forward with an ability to estimate the grip 35% faster than before. Let's go to CT off. <laughs> 830 brake horsepower all going to the rear wheels. And we're on a cup to our tyre as well, remember. Traction is amazingly good given that all the power is just going to the rear wheels. Nice and smooth there, and CT off, just a bit of oversteer. Let's try again on this corner. Really smooth and progressive on the oversteer. They say this is fun to drive. 
it really is. And you're going to jump into a car with 830 brake horsepower and feel this at home in it this quickly. This is mighty impressive. Just two flying laps is in so many ways not long enough. But to be honest, that's pretty much all the rear Michelin Cup 2R tyres felt like they were good for before they started to really overheat and make it look looser than Gilles Villeneuve on the limit. From what I've heard, it's not a tyre trait that is specific to Ferrari, but I suppose it does make the rubber a perfect match for the drivetrain's one lap qualifying mode. Ooh. I think now we should go on the road. first acquaintance, what I really like about this is that it integrates the hybrid systems very, very well. We've always been used to Ferrari integrating the electronic systems in terms of sort of things like side slip control and making them feel seamless, really. And I think they've done the same with this hybrid system. It automatically starts up in electric mode and it just works. And the nice thing is you can deplete it, you watch, you're thinking, well, I'm depleting this quite quickly, but actually then you put it into you know, the performance mode and it goes back up again quite quickly. In terms of your electric mode, so you don't feel afraid to use that battery power. I actually drove the first 10 kilometres away from the circuit on battery power alone, as I was just pottering through congestion and crawling through a conurbation. And it was very enjoyable. I remember feeling the same sense of satisfaction when I first drove the Porsche 918 Spyder in its EV mode eight years ago. The 296 still drew attention on the Spanish streets, but there was less ostentation thanks to the silence. I like that. And importantly, the 296 still felt special to be in, even without the V6 running. It's fascinating getting into this on the road because, well, there are these standard sort of Ferrari things. You just spend a little bit of time getting used to looking around the car, to seeing you know, the, the view out over the front, those front arches there, the haunches that make it easy to place. It feels a really wide car, but also really low, this amazing visor wraparound screen. And then you look in the mirrors, you see those intakes for the intercoolers, and those amazing haunches with a lovely crease along the top of them. Everywhere you look out of this car, I think it's thrilling. Other things to mention, sort of in terms of a, a road driving package, the digital dash, I'm not sure about that. It leaves a nicely sort of clean interior, but it's just the, the graphics on it, kind of, I'm not, not a huge fan of those. They look really quite busy. The rest of the steering wheel is pretty busy as well. It was always, you know, and always a lot going on with these Ferrari steering wheels, but in this, there's arguably a little bit too much. Luckily, I've got used to the fact that you've got the sort of the E Manatino now on this side for the engine and then the Dynamics one on this side with then just pressing it for the Mopey Road button, which is not something that's I'd say I've needed today, perhaps a bit more in the UK. When you get to a good piece of road like this, well, the first thing I think you need to do is put it into race. Although on the Manatino, the dynamic side of the Manatino, you've got sport, which kind of makes you think, oh, that's sort of that should be good enough for a a drive down a road like this but actually I think that's more of a sort of they wouldn't want to call it normal because they wouldn't like to refer to this car as normal in any way because it's not really but definitely you want to click into race because it just tightens the whole car the whole car feels taut anyway and this just means that the suspension matches that tautness it means you've got the precision in the dampers to match that of the steering. Oh, and if it felt fast on track, it really feels fast on road. Traction is really good though, thankfully. And it's nice because on the road, the front end, I, I need to spend a bit more time with it. I think you do get used to it, but I love the sense of connection to the rear end. You feel that shorter wheelbase, 50 mil shorter than previous mid-engine cars that they've done. got a really lovely sense of connection to that rear axle. Pretty crucial, obviously. <laughs> it's a really easy engine to rev out, actually, and 
you want to be high up in the revs to get that sense of it being a little V12. That's where the character of that comes through and I can really appreciate what they were trying to say. And as ever, gearbox, just stunning how fast it is. These big paddles, not carbon for ones, used to seeing them in the optional carbon, it's quite nice to see them in the standard silver. After driving the 296 GTB for a couple of hours on the road, I was left impressed by the contrasts it created. There is the obvious one inherent in the hybrid powertrain. The sudden noise when the V6 wakes up, or the switch to silence when it shuts down. Then there is the breadth of the chassis, with the adaptive dampers allowing it to feel very usable and comfortable one minute, then monstrously grippy and fast and taut the next. Similarly, the styling in this, it's that lovely contrast again between sort of the, the old fashioned, the retro hints of the 250LM and the much more modern. Contrast is good. As with the track, my time in the relatively firm bucket seat on the road was over all too quickly. It's a complicated car, this 296 GTB. Ferrari has positioned it firmly around the idea of divertimento di guida, which loosely translates as the fun to drive factor. But I think the hybrid systems make it more complex than that. So rather than draw any snap conclusions at the end of the day, I decided to sleep on it. Not literally, obviously. It's the day after the 296 GTB launch. We're in Malaga Airport waiting to fly home. And I just thought it was worth doing a bit of a conclusion because it's a complicated car and I've had a bit more time now to reflect on it and think about it. And particularly about the hybrid system. And I think it, to me, it comes down to the sort of, there's two ways you can look at it. Does the hybrid system add something in terms of performance? Well, to me, not particularly, no. I mean, a, a V6, turbocharged V6 with 663 brake horsepower on its own in the car, you, you, know, you save what is it, about 130 kilos without all the hybrid gubbins, and it would probably feel a, a purer car. So in performance terms, no, I don't think it adds anything for, for me. But do I like having it in the car? Yes, I do actually, because I think it adds another dimension to the car in terms of its usability and how you feel about it. Because in this day and age, driving a supercar, it can feel like you're being frowned upon a bit, to be honest. And the ability to drive through a town or village silently knowing that you have zero emissions is frankly quite nice. Hybrid as a performance advantage, I'm not so sure about, but hybrid generally within the 296 GTB. I'm for it. I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you very much indeed for watching. There's Glenn working hard, getting all the details on the car. Um, please do remember to subscribe to Carfection uh, because, well, it really helps us. We want to reach a million subscribers as soon as possible and you don't want to miss out on more films like this, do you? So yes, do that, hit the notification buttons as well. Subscribe to us on social media as well, at Carfection Films. I'm at Henry Catchpole on Instagram as well. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching.